Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Um, yes, I've got this big fat book now. So one of the things that I've been doing of late is to try to give you a sort of sampling of how things sort of develop and either stay the same or change. Mainly they stay the same. I think, you know, you're given a certain number of uh, totemic images or um, material, whatever it is, that you write about over and over again. So it mainly stay the same, but you might hear some differences. So I thought I would read to you, not from all the books, but from each decade. So I've been at it for, well, the first, first poems in here date back to 1976. So I'll let you do that math. So what I'm gonna do is I picked um, one figure and you will be able to recognize it or that'll be on the quiz afterwards. You can say, you know, what, what is the figure? And so this is from one of the earliest poems that's uh, collected, that's one of the earliest ones and one of the first ones I remember writing in Vermont once I came to Vermont. And it's called Tropics. In the still morning, when you move toward me in sleep for love, I dream of an island where long-stemmed cranes, serious weather vanes, turn slowly on one foot. There, the dragonfly folds his mica wings and rides the tall reed close as a handle. The hippo yawns, nods to thick pythons, slack and drowsy, who droop down like untied sashes from the trees. The brash hyenas do not cackle and run, but lie with their paws on their heads like dogs. The lazy crow's call falls like a sigh. In the field below, the fat moles build their dull passage with an old instinct that needs no light or waking. Its slow beat turns the hand in sleep as we turn toward each other in the ripe air of summer before the change of weather, before the heavy drop of the apples. Okay, now I'm gonna switch up to 1983. This is from um, my second book, The Forces of Pliny, and this is called The Apology. Hurt dogs crawl under a bush. A hurt friend circles the house, refusing to look in. He makes a grave commotion in the yard and the jay elevates the clamor of betrayal, betrayal flashing its shiny edges from the pine. You call through the glass, no answer. He's busy with his curses, scuffing up a froth of dandelions. Isn't this what you wanted? Your own grievance that sets the table with one white plate? Water on stones, horses dozing upright in their stalls, the pink of a weak sky, recalling the tertiary theme of some great work, you cross the grass, moving toward him, the way one greets an animal, extending the hand. So now, many pages go by. You can imagine the calendar pages also flipping off in a bad movie.
Okay, this is called The Trust. And this is from the lotus flowers. Something was killing sheep, but it was sheep this dog attended on the farm, a black and white border collie patrolling his fold like a parish priest. The second time the neighbor came, claiming to have spotted the dog at night, a crouched figure slithering toward the pen on the far side of the county, the farmer let him witness how the dog, alert and steady, mended the frayed edge of the flock, the clumped sheep calm as they drifted together along the stony hill. But still more sheep across the glen were slaughtered, and the man returned more confident. This time, the master called his dog forward and, stroking the eager head, prized open the mouth to find wound around the base of the back teeth, squat molars the paws can't reach to clean, small coils of wool, fine and stiff like threads from his own jacket. So he took down the rifle from the rack and shot the dog and buried him, the best companion in the field for seven years. Once satisfied, the appetite is never dulled again. Night after night, its sweet, insistent promise drives the animal under the rail fence and miles away for a fresh kill, and with guilty cunning brings him back to his familiar charges, just now stirring in the early light, brings him home to his proud husbandry. Okay, this one also from the lotus flowers. This one is called Nightshade. I don't know if you know, if you remember Nightshade, but it used to be that um, some of the women in New Orleans used to put it in their eyes because it dilates the pupils. And we all know that that's very, very sexy, right? To have the dilated pupils. So that's why they would do it. And it's called Nightshade. The dog lay under the house, having crawled back beyond the porch, bellying beneath the joists and rocks and red dirt to the cool stone foundation where it died, as the children called and sobbed. And now their father had to wrench it out, the one he had been breaking to handle birds. This was a man of strictest moderation, who had heard a dash of strychnine in its beat could be a tonic for a dog, an extra edge. He loved that dog and got the dosage wrong. And I loved my father. I was among the children looking on and for years would not forgive him. Without pure evil in the world, there was no east or west, no pole star and no ratifying dove. I sat inside the small white house for hours deaf to the world, playing my two songs, one in a major, the other in a sad minor key. Okay, now I'm gonna switch over again, flip forward to another book, another decade, and I'm gonna read from uh, Kyrie. Kyrie is how we have to say that. There's a lot of Kyrie now because that's a very popular name among basketball players, among other people, Kyrie. But if you were Catholic or a musician, then you would know it's Kyrie from the, from the mass. Okay, so I'll read a couple of these. Two of these, I believe. All ears, nose, tongue, and gut. Dogs know if something is wrong. Chickens don't know a thing. Their brains are little more than optic nerve. They think it's been a very short day and settle in the pines. Good night, head under wing, near their cousins, 
but welded to a lower branch. Dogs, all kinds of dogs, signals are their job. They cock their heads, their backs bristle. Even house dogs wake up and circle the wool rug. Outside the vacant yard, then within minutes, something eats the sun. Okay, and now from later on in the sequence. Around the house, uneasy stillness falls. The dog stiffens the roof at her ears, stands, looks to the back door, looks to the stairwell, licks her master's shoe. What she hears must be a pitch high on the Orphic scale, a light disturbance in the air, like flicks of an insect's wings or a reed's whistle, distant and brief. He barely stirs. Out in the kitchen, something seems to settle. Cloth on a dish, dust on a chair. The animal whimpers now, but doesn't growl. This absence has a smell. Poor master. It touched him, too, that shift in molecules, but all he feels is more of what's not there. Okay, let's zip on up to 2002. Okay, um, I'm going to read now a couple of, again, from a sequence. And so I'm just going to pick out the relevant sections. And I'm going to read three of these. And the, um, the title of the whole sequence is The Art of Distance. And it's from the book a Shadow of Heaven. Wrinkle coming toward me in the grass, no, fatter than that, rickrack, or the scallops a ruffle makes, down to about the 14th vertebra. The rest of it, rod instead of a coil. So I'd been wrong the afternoon before, when the dog, curious, eager to play and board with me, as I harvested the edge of the raspberry thicket, stalked it from the back stoop to the lip of the bank and grabbed the tip in her mouth and tossed it. Sudden vertical shudder, shoulder level. Wrong to read survival in its cursive, spiraling back to the cellar window well where it had gathered field mouse like a cat. And now, if it meant to be heading for the brook, it veered off course, its blunt head raised like a swimmer's in distress. The functioning part gave out just short of me, inside the shade but not the bush. The damaged part, two fingers thick, was torqued, pale belly up, sun struck. I left it where it was, took the dog in, and for hours watched from the kitchen window what seemed a peeled stick, the supple upper body that had dragged it now pointed away and occluded by the shade, the uncut grass. My strict father would have been appalled not to dispatch a uselessly suffering thing made me the same, he'd say, as the man who, seeing a toad, catatonic Buddha in its niche, wedged within the vice of a snake's efficient mouth, clamped open for, then closing slowly down and overed it, bludgeoned them both with the flat side of a hoe. For once, I will accept my father's judgment, but this had been my yard, my snake, old enemy, resident at the back side of the house. For hours, the pent dog panting and begging, 
I watched from the window as from a towel wall until it vanished, reluctant arrow aimed at where the berries ripened and fell. Now, from the same sequence, The Art of Distance, here's number three. They shaved the torso from behind the nape, across the shoulder to the center chest, taking away exactly the noble ruff and adjacent sable winter-thickened fur, making, when she crouches at my feet, the joint and sinew discernible under the startled skin, as in those close-up photos from the veldt, as if she were hunched above a slack gazelle. But when she's sleeping on her side, her neck extended might be the slack gazelles. 57 stitches tracked from the spine, inside the sheltering ridge of the collarbone, down to where the trachea enters lung, their puckered, punctuated seam gathering what something split apart, some creature cornered in the woods or field, no trophy, no raw meat except her own, no carcass pinioned now beneath her paws, only the wretched quilt torn and stained. An obedient, courteous dog, she is abashed to pee indoors, she doesn't squat, she stands with her head low like a whipped horse as the gush puddles the floor. And even though, or because, mainly when I touch her, it is to apply the many therapies prescribed, pills down her throat, hot compress on the draining wound, or to smooth the palate of her lying in, she neither whimpers loudly nor draws back. Therefore, she seems not only dutiful, but grateful, too, as though the touch conveyed a recognition, a bond, if not of pain, indignity, compassion not for another, but for oneself, which makes my hand enact a tenderness, like the rough, warm tongue that licks the weak one clean. Okay, then number five, again from the Art of Distance. After lunch, on the side porch, the uncinched wooden leg and a muddy boot stood by the edge of the bed. Freed from the second boot, a full-length human leg, denim on white chenille. The other stopped at a blunt, substantial thigh. Its puckered stump facing me looked like a face or a fist. I looked at it hard. Four hands, three legs, and half a brain, my uncle said what my grandmother salvaged from the war, her brother's wounded sons, sullen Ed with his lump, Grover hunched and simpering. They worked the fields and in the barn, ate in her kitchen, hair slick from washing up, like the hired hands. When she said grace, my grandmother said it standing, bandaging her hand in her apron skirt to lift the cast iron skillet out of its round hole to the square table of men. Burn herself up, her daughter said on Sundays, visiting like me and scolding my uncle, but still she fed with her fingers the squat stove and her grown wards chopped this wood and hauled it, pumped water, hauled it, cut hay, hauled it, hauled the pig and cow and chicken shit and stirred the flies. You keep out of the barn, my uncle said, after he found me wrapped by what they'd found, thick braid 
hung from a beam, enlarged, hung from a beam. Two black snakes writhing there like a hot wire, a lit fuse. What else do you need to know? That my uncle, who was the baby, who went to war and came home whole, who had no children, had no brothers, therefore got the farm, would sell the farm. My uncle brought home for Grover a puppy that liked to sleep in my grandmother's lap and lick her plate. Dirty little dogs, her daughter said, and a slick red racing bike, which was not with its manual brakes. The joke you think. Ed stretched his crutch on the rack of the handlebars, slewed the stiff leg out and pumped the other, his sly pleasure breaking through perfected scorn, cruising the porch where I sat, hoeing peas in a china bowl. Sometimes the world looks back. Okay, I'm gonna jump forward again. I'm just looking at my clock down there to see how we're doing on time. Okay, I'm going to jump forward to um, a poem from uh, Messenger, which is my new and selected poems. They came out in 2006. This poem is called Red Bud. Everywhere, like grass, toad flax, yellow coils, a girl's pin curls, Overhead, the purely ornamental fruits, whites and pinks thick on the bough, and straight ahead along the path, spice viburnum, exotic shrub, named for the smell its clustered flowers held, nutmeg that made St. Louis tropical. We walked a lush, vast, groomed preserve, preserve in the sense meant by self-indulgent kings, and in the sense meant by science, every bloom and bine and bowl, each independent green was labeled. That was what we loved. And at the center, bronzed, Linnaeus, master of design, whose art it was to shepherd any living thing into its proper pasture. There, foam flower. There, lungwort. Vernacular spilled milk, leaf splashed with white, a graceful pulmonaria in the language of greatest clarity, which classifies lilies and roses, rose of lilac, and here at our feet, shade drunk dark herb, wormwood, our word for bitterness, and Artemisia, the hunter, goddess made incarnate on the ground, in whose name the avid mortal watching her was torn apart. Where was his name? Where was his flower? A cloud paused in the spring sky, and there came to us then on the path another blossoming, radiant in mauve, head to toe, back braced as though to balance the weight of full breasts, one hand gloved, lifted unthinking to pet the back of the hair, the hair itself a lacquered helmet, and what should we make of her height, her heft, the size of her feet, the gruff swagger in the gait? We stared outright. It seemed all right to stare, like Linnaeus, who'd ranked the stones and sorted the plants by how they propagate and colonize whatever crawls and swims and flies and bears live young. Light by which I've lived, the wish to name, to know, the work of it, the cost of it. If only I could be, or want to be, more like that boy, ignorant, stunned, human. Acteon, you said, by his own hounds torn asunder. 
and so the brief shadow flickered and dissolved. The world was ours again, the world like this, made less confused, and we strolled like kings back down the path, past a redbud tree in plush white bloom. Okay, and then I'm just gonna skip on over to for two more and close this out. And then I think we're gonna not take the break until after Jeffrey, is that right? Okay, so we'll have Jeffrey right away, which I'm very much looking forward to. And I'm gonna switch over to the most recent book, Headwaters, which appeared in 2013. And this is called Hound. And I'll read two from this, and then we'll hear Jeffrey. Since thought is prayer, if hard and true, I thought that thought could leave me to compassion for my fellow creatures. Insects excluded, contrary to the Buddha, I swat them dead. The wasps might show a little compassion too. I do include the hound next door. It moans all day, all night, a loud, slow lament. A child can make itself sustain to dramatize its misery. This dog was once the neighbor's child, but now they have an actual child. He's been cast down to be a dog again, chained outdoors, heartsick, uncomprehending. Why can't he just buck up, remember his roots, his lot, not more special than any other. Sad hound, look up at the fledglings' wide mouths. Look over here at the cat teaching her litter how to hunt, all sleek, all black. They're interchangeable. Her many tits confirm no favorites, no first, no last. At least with only two, both can be a kind of favorite. It's better than three, I ought to know. My sister and I each had one parent to herself, like T for two. It wasn't hard to be the boy until there came an actual boy. He was nothing like my father. What does it mean to have flown from the same nest into the world? You're thinking one is best, one open mouth, no first, no last. But isn't it then the parents who compete? No wonder the father of animals wanders off. The best is two, all right. One parent and one child. We've seen it work among the elephants. Okay, and then the last one is called Noble Dog. Okay. Noble dog. Behind our house, down to the brook in the woods, beyond the groomed grass and flower beds, what we see are brook and woods and sometimes mild creatures of the field. We thought when we bathed in the claw-footed tub we could pretend we stayed inside the natural world no shutters, no shades. At night, beside the mirror, over the sink, the windows darkened into mirrors where my daughter at 13 admired her tan, her new body, until she felt, or thought she felt, something move outside in the yard and asked quietly up the back stairs for us to come down here for just a minute, please. Come down here now. We couldn't tell how much was fear, how much was shame. We thought she needed us to be calm. We tried to be calm, like the trooper we called, who said without alarm to the handsome, noble dog, where is he, buddy? Where is he, buddy? At which, as if in a game of fetch, 
the dog went straight around the house to the one smell that didn't fit, to the one smell that crossed the clipped grass, into the ditch beside the dirt road where the dog went to. The dog tracking the smell, the trooper tracking the dog, the dog not barking or baying until the scent stopped inside the culvert, bearing the brook west under the road, a large metal pipe that amplified the dog's whimpers and moans. Dog of righteousness, dog of retribution. We heard it from our house where soon the shutters would go up. We sat in the kitchen, the summer air soft as a damp rag. We knew this was a moment of consequence, but we couldn't tell whether the world had grown larger or smaller. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.